Hi everyone, welcome to our lesson on antiderivatives. And um, <clears throat> in the last lesson we talked about how for a moving car, the function describing the velocity is the derivative with respect to time of the function describing the position. So our function describing the position, we call the S of T. So S means position, T means time. And if you wanna know about the velocity function, you know, the function um, of time that describes the velocity, well, that's actually just the derivative of the position function. That's s prime of t. Now, suppose you were given the function describing the velocity of the car. So we're actually, in this case, given this v of t function. How could you describe the position of the car as a function of time? In other words, how could you describe well, p of t in this case, you would need to find what we call the antiderivative, you know, because going, going in this direction from knowing the position to then finding the velocity function, that's taking the derivative. Going in the opposite direction from knowing the velocity function to finding the position function, that is um, finding the antiderivative, you know, so, so the antiderivative is sort of moving in the opposite direction as, as, you, as you go when you find the derivative. And so, um, excuse me, uh, what I like to do in this case um, is, well, let me just rewrite this and, and distribute that t. So I get 60t minus t squared. And then for each of these terms, think about what possible term, if you took the derivative, would give you um, 60t, for example. So if you took the derivative, what would give you 60t? And um, I, I'm i just guessing here, and we can check it here in a minute if it doesn't work, but I would think that 30t squared could be the antiderivative here. Because if I started from 30t squared and I took the derivative, well, that two exponent would go out in front and multiply 30, so I'd get 60, and then the t squared would just become t. And so yeah, I think that 30t squared is the antiderivative of 60t. Now let's look at this term, this minus t squared. Well, what could possibly be the antiderivative of minus t squared? Well, it'll probably be a t with some sort of higher exponent. You know, if it, if it were t cubed, you take the derivative, that'll be something times t squared. And so um, actually you can play around with the coefficient a little bit, but you'll find that actually if you have one third t cubed, that when you take the three down and multiply the coefficient, that goes away and you end up with negative t squared. So in fact, negative one third t cubed is the antiderivative of t squared. And notice if you take the derivative of all of this stuff that I've included in this you know, darker red color marker, um, and you, you take the derivative of this stuff, well, then you would get what I wrote in blue. That's why it's the antiderivative. And I'm gonna show you something uh, that's also you know, relatively important, which is whenever you're doing these um, antiderivatives, always, always for an antiderivative, remember to write this, plus c, where c stands for a constant. You're saying, um, my antiderivative is actually all of this stuff that's sort of specific to what we saw on the derivative side, on the, the side of the original function, the velocity function in this case, plus c, you know, plus some constant. And we don't know what that constant is, but remember that if you're going in the opposite direction, that is, if you're going in the direction of the derivative, the derivative of any constant is zero. So in fact, this plus zero is already implied and we don't really have to draw it over here on the velocity function, but this position, um, this position function needs this plus c. So that's actually very important. And so anyways, um, if this is your velocity function, then you know that this is your position function. Okay, let's move on. Now remember that the derivative of a constant is zero, then we could add a constant c to the antiderivative, and the antiderivative will still be correct. So we saw that. In our, pro in our problem with the moving car, this c constant represents the initial position of the car. 
When taking antiderivatives, always remember the plus c. Okay, so what did I say here? In our problem with the moving car, this c represents the initial position of the car. And why is that? Well, let's think about when t is equal to zero. So when t is equal to zero, p of zero is going to be, well, 30 times zero squared minus one third times zero cube well, plus c. So that means p of zero is equal to something times zero minus something times zero plus c. So actually, when your time, when t, the variable t, is equal to zero, then your position is just whatever the c constant is. And so if you started off, you know, five miles down the track, then this c would be positive five. Okay. Without being too concerned about the meaning of the notation, here is how you will see the antiderivative of sine of x with respect to x. So we're looking for the, sine, the antiderivative of sine of x with respect to x. So um, this squiggle um, is what we would write when we're trying to write the antiderivative, hence the squiggle. Sine of x, of course, we see where our function appears. Sine of x is right here. And then with respect to x, that little bit that tells us we're taking the antiderivative with respect to our variable x, that comes in this little dx we throw in at the end. And so one way that you can think about this for now is imagine your bookends. You know, typically on your, on your bookshelf at home, uh, you have uh, a shelf with, you know, several books and the books are kind of holding each other up um, there in the middle. But on either end of the, sh of the shelf, or on either end of the books, you actually have to have some kind of bookend to keep these guys standing upright, otherwise they would fall over. And so for the bookends, um, yeah, I'm not I'm doing a very good job drawing. Uh, they're typically very decorative and, um, you know, pretty heavy to hold up books, but, um, you have a bookend on the left and a bookend on the right that, that sort of holds these all these books together. I, I like to think of these guys as bookends. Here's my left bookend. It tells me, hey, this squiggle means I'm starting the description of the function of which we're taking the antiderivative. And this dx on the right is kind of like my right side bookend. It says, hey, we're done describing the function of which we're about to take the antiderivative. So that's one way to think about those. That's actually pretty pretty good and pretty utilitarian. Now the antiderivative of sine of x, well let's do this. So <clears throat> the antiderivative of sine of x is, um, well that will be negative cosine of x. And why is that? Well the derivative of cosine x is negative sine of x, if I take the derivative, and you know I, I'm going to carry down my negative sign, so this is negative, negative sine of x, in fact that's sine of x. So you should always be able to double check yourself. If you find an antiderivative, like we found that negative cosine x is the antiderivative of sine x, you should be able to check your answer by taking the derivative of your answer and making sure it's the original function you started with. And so in this case, it checks out. The antiderivative of three x squared is going to be, um, well, it'll be x cubed and how do you know? Well, if you take the derivative of x cubed using power rule, that becomes 3x squared, so that checks out. Now, the antiderivative of secant squared x is tangent x, and you would know that if you had memorized or if you were looking at your derivatives of common functions pages, that's in the reference pages um, that I gave you this year. And if you, know, if, you, if you didn't have that, well, if you didn't have that memorized, it would be really difficult to arrive at um, and of course, checking this, checking that tangent is the um, antiderivative of secant, just means taking the derivative of tangent, and uh, you know, the derivative of tangent, of course, is secant squared, and that's the fact that we memorized in the first place. Finally, hopefully, you know, I mean, kudos if you caught this already, but remember that for every antiderivative, I have to write plus c to indicate that I could add any sort of constant. 
as long as it's not a function of my variable, as long as it's just some constant, then you can add that plus c with impunity. And when you take the derivative, of course, it'll go away to 0. So we always write the plus c for every antiderivative. So this would be tangent x plus c. This would be x cubed plus c. And this would be negative cosine x plus c. And these are the correct answers. And if this were a quiz or a test and I don't see the plus c, of course I will be taking off points because you'll see that this plus c is actually very important when it comes to practical applications of antiderivatives. Now this definitely looks silly. Um, <clears throat> and the squiggle on the left and the dx on the right may just feel like bookends holding up books on a bookshelf. That's how I felt about it in high school, so that's a totally okay interpretation for now. The base source of knowledge on antiderivatives will just be reversing the derivatives table you memorized earlier this year. So remember that table that says derivatives of common functions. You should have memorized that. And if you just look at those in reverse, you know, um, like for example, I told you that the derivative of um, natural log of x is 1 over x. Well, that tells you that if you're trying to take the antiderivative of 1 over x dx, then you could write natural log x, and then don't forget plus c. So <clears throat> if you take the derivative now of natural log x plus c, what you get is 1 over x. And so this is the proper antiderivative. And that's what I mean when I say that your base source of knowledge on antiderivatives will just be reversing the derivatives table you memorized earlier this year. Each one of those memorized derivatives also represents a minimized antiderivative, you know, just using this process. We will also be memorizing even more common antiderivatives than these. So, for example, um, you know, we know that the antiderivative of secant squared of x is tangent x, but what is the antiderivative of tangent? Well, if you go and look at your common um, your derivatives of common functions page, you won't find the uh, any any derivative on that sheet that gives you tangent x after you take the derivative. There's no functions um, on that sheet anyways. There's no functions that give you tangent x as the derivative. So um, I've prepared another sheet that gives you sort of a, the same kind of reference for these particular antiderivatives, and I'll show you that here now. So um, let me bring it over here. This is the antiderivatives of common functions page. Uh, so this is again a very good thing to memorize. And power rule, you know, maybe that's obvious for you and so you don't really need to set this to memory because you've memorized the derivative power rule and you can reverse that pretty easily. Notice the antiderivative of e to the x is, as, as you might expect, it's e to the x, so that's pretty good. Um, and so a lot of these things, maybe they're what you expected them to be. But it's also good to see, well, the antiderivative of tangent x is the negative natural log of cosine x plus c. And, you know, we have some other pretty easy to memorize antiderivatives here on this reference as well. But um, if you conjecture that one of these, you know, one of these antiderivatives, uh, it's really easy to prove. Well, you just take the derivative of the conjectured expression. So let's say I, I conjecture that the antiderivative of tangent x with respect to x is negative natural log of cosine of x plus c. Well, I'll just take the derivative of this guy and see what I get. Of course, this is going to be a chain rule problem. Um, so I'm taking the derivative of a composition of functions, and that gives me f prime g times g prime. Um, my outside function, I'm calling f, is clearly going to be the negative natural log function. Um, so f prime will be the derivative of the natural log, so negative 1 over x. Uh, g is my inside function, so that'll be cosine x. And of course, g prime is going to be negative sine of x. So what I get whenever I combine all this into f prime of g times g prime, I will get I uh, negative one over well uh, cosine x times g prime is times negative sine of x 
Um, so that's actually positive sine of x in the numerator, negative 1 times negative sine of x, divided by cosine x. And you should be familiar with this trig identity um, and know that sine of x divided by cosine x is equal to tangent x. So that checks out. And of course, your, your plus c goes to 0 in the derivative. So um, it works, and we've, we've proved it. We've verified that this um, conjectured antiderivative is, in fact, um, the correct antiderivative. Aside from memorization, you should also remember that the antiderivative operator is a linear operator. That is, antiderivatives have the very useful properties of additivity and homogeneity. Additivity, let's just look at the additivity property, means that for functions f of x and g of x, if you're taking the antiderivative of some function plus another function, or minus another function, by the way, you know, I don't include the minus because you could just say that, well, my g of x function is negative, and so that eliminates the need to, to express it as a minus. But if you have the antiderivative of f of x plus g of x, that's equal to if you took these antiderivatives separately. Um, and that's what we mean when we say additivity. And sort of you can, you can, you know, to either take the operator of the sum or take the sum of the operators of each individual function. Um, where your operator is the antiderivative, and both of these are equal. These are the same. So use that to your advantage. Um, homogeneity um, means that when alpha is a constant, this is a Greek letter alpha, um, if you're taking the antiderivative of some constant times the function f of x, that's just equal to what it would be if you took alpha outside of the antiderivative. You know, just just plop it out here in front instead, you know? And um, you'll find that these expressions are equal, and that's totally acceptable to do. So use that one to your advantage. Um, now suppose we know the acceleration of a moving car is given by this function. Um, so this one's acceleration, right? What function describes the position of the same car? Well, remember, um, Remember that acceleration is the derivative of velocity, and velocity function is the derivative of position. I'll use a p for position, I guess. Um, that means that your, your acceleration function is actually the second derivative of position. And so this might actually be kind of a long problem um, to do as an example, but I'll, I'll try my best here to do it quickly. So I'm going to need the antiderivative of acceleration. So let me let me draw this out so you have a good concept map. You have position, velocity, acceleration. And as you go from position to velocity in this direction, you're taking the derivative of position with respect to time to get from position to velocity. If you want to get from velocity to acceleration, you also have to take the derivative with respect to time. Now, if you're trying to go from acceleration to velocity, you take the antiderivative with respect to time. And if you want to go from velocity to position, you have to take the antiderivative with respect to time. So I'm given acceleration. I want to get to position. What I'm going to have to do is on two occasions take the antiderivative with respect to time. Ah, oh, and again, this is so embarrassing. These x's, these should be t's. I did that in the last lesson too. So I will correct these notes before I send them out. OK, um, so skip the p of t for now. You know, like that's our end goal. But right now, let's look for v of t. So what's the antiderivative of 12t? Well, um, to me, it seems like this should be like maybe 4t squared. And if I take the derivative of 4t squared, I actually get 8t. So I messed up, and that's OK. You know, sometimes this is a guess and check game. What about if I tried 6t squared? Well, now if I take the derivative of 6t squared, I would get 12t, and that's what I'm going for. So that works. Now, plus 40, what's the antiderivative of that? Well, it would be 40t. You take the derivative of 40t, and you get 40. So that works. And then what about minus? to cosine of t. Well, I'll keep the minus 2 there. 
and I'm looking for the antiderivative of cosine. And I remember that if I take the derivative of sine, that gives me cosine, right? So um, I think sine is a good bet. You can try taking the antiderivative here. And, or sorry, you can try taking the derivative of negative 2 sine of t, and I think you find that it's negative 2 cosine of t, and so this checks out as well. Um, now, um, what am I missing? Somebody please tell me. <laughs> you know, shout it, at, shout it at your computer monitor if you want. Um, but what I'm missing here is the very, very, very important, what you must not forget, plus c. Uh, do not forget that. That's my formula for velocity. Of course, we're not stopping here. We want to know the position function. So let's jot down position function now. What's the antiderivative of 6t squared? Now I'm going to take another wild guess here and say that it's 2t cubed. And sure enough, if I take the derivative of 2t cubed, that gives me 6t squared. And so um, that one checks out plus 40t, let me try plus 20t squared. And if I take the derivative of 20t squared, that gives me 40t, so that one checks out. Finally, minus 2 sine of t. What if I um, try maybe uh, plus 2 cosine of t? If I take the derivative of plus 2 cosine t, remember derivative of cosine is negative sine, so that would actually work. Um, hopefully you can see that one. Now, the antiderivative of plus c is going to be plus c times t, right? Take the derivative of c times t and you get plus c. So that one checks out. All right, and I'm ready to go, right? Not exactly. I have to actually... Um, Remember to take, again, add a constant here. And to keep these c's apart, I'll use a subscript 1 for that c and a subscript 2 for that c. So I have two different cons constants. You know, they could both be anything and still give me the correct velocity function and the correct acceleration function. Um, and so actually, this here, this guy, is the correct solution, the general form for a position function um, position as a function of time, um, where if you take the second derivative, it gives you this acceleration function that we were provided in our, our problem statement. And so that's all there is to it for taking antiderivatives. And um, thank you for watching to the end, and I'll see you in the next video.